Well, good evening, gentlemen. Um, I think I'm audible. Can I get an indication from Marco if I am visible and audible before I proceed with the opening? Thank you very much, colleagues. All right. Uh, my name is Sonobo Stirman. Uh, I'm part of NRED. Um, that is the hosting entity, which is housed at the Nelson Mandela University. My role, colleagues, today is very short and brief, is to welcome all of you to this critical lecture, which will be provided by U Professor Simposi Santi. Just a quick one to inform the colleagues who have joined in this afternoon that this lecture form part of the Nelson Mandela University's Diversity Month celebration, which coincides with Women's Month in South Africa, which serves as a venue to highlight women's achievements and discussions, continuings and emerging women's empowerment and gender equality issues and concerns, challenges and commitments. As part of our scholarship of engagement at Kenred um, pertaining the advocacy education and training. We have established a Kenred series on women erasure in South African politics and liberations. And this whole material is available at Kenred. We have started our first seminar on, on women erasure in 2019. Then beginning of last year, 2020, we then had a second lecture which was focusing on women erasure in higher education in the context of South Africa. <clears throat> Excuse me for that. So this lecture also is a continuation of that. And the broader aim is to provide the research and to foreground African women's biographies, intellectual productions and political histories. And uh, as I've indicated initially, if you are interested, you are writing maybe your dissertation or a commentary on political liberations and the women erasure in South Africa. We do have a strong material at Kenred in that regard. And today, Prof. Santis is using the 70 years of Elson's commissions to highlight the impact of bound education. Um, after so many years in South Africa, focusing on Umama or Phyllis Ndandala, um, who is a prolific writer, an activist um, who has been living or who have lived in the USA while she was in exile over there. But of course, with her originals from the Eastern Cape in South Africa. So I would like to welcome Professor Santi, who is our key speaker for this afternoon. Uh, who come from the University of the Western Cape. I'm sure we all know Professor Santi as the friend of the university, um, as an ally of the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy, who will be providing us with his insights on the role of Umama Ophelis Ndandala um, in our African liberations, especially in the context of education. Then also to welcome Uprof Maseko, our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, who will be responding to the issues that will transpire from the lecture given by Uprofessor Sasanti. And also we have Uayanda Tito, who, who is an associate um, of the Center for Women and Gender Studies, and also a friend of Ukenred. Uayanda is a gender activist who is based in Johannesburg. And then to also welcome Use Tunguni, Use Tu from the University of KwaZulu Natal, who will be facilitating today's program. And then last but not least, the whole community of the Nelson Mandela University, the community of the Nelson Mandela Bay, the community of the province and the entire South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Kenred and the Nelson Mandela University, I'd like to welcome all of you. And I'm sure that transpiring from this lecture, we will take home so much that we'll mull over and even apply in our context, um, in our networks, in our institutions, and in our 
ongoing liberations in South Africa. Without wasting any time, I would like to hand over now to Uset Tunguni and welcome her on the stage. Then she will take over and facilitate the lecture. Thank you very much. Over to you, Setu. All right, I'm not sure if it's my side, Setu, you are not audible. I cannot hear you from the side. All right, and also some audience members cannot hear you. It's a pity that we, we just had a dry run and we could hear you loud and clear. Did you do anything to your laptop? Because we, we completely cannot hear you. All right. Can you try now, say two? S still, I, I cannot hear you. Just five minutes ago, I could hear you loud and clear and everyone could hear you. I'm not sure what could have happened now. All right. All right, I think so too, whilst we are doing that, maybe um, I can just assume this moment and just introduce oh, Prof. Sasanti, and then I'm sure as we're continuing, you will figure out. All right, let's just quickly check if oh, Prof. Sasanti is there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think um, when we start okay. comes. Can you hear me now? Can hear you now, Setu. Thank you oh, very much. Beautiful. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, All right, okay. Mr. has said, my name is Setu Nguna, and I have the honor today of facilitating what I believe to be an incredible testament to our intellectual history as well as our present. Um, I'll begin by starting this responsibility that I've been given by uh, providing the introductions to our esteemed guest speaker and someone I believe to be a pillar of Pan-Africanist thought, uh, both within the country and beyond, Prof. Sungiwe Sasanti. Uh, Prof. Sasanti is a professor at the University of Western Cape uh, within the Faculty of Education and is a former editor of the International Journal of African Renaissance Studies. Um, he holds two PhDs one within the journalism, uh, one in journalism studies from from Stellis, uh, and the other in philosophy from Witz. Uh, he has taught at Stellenbosch for seven years, uh, as well as at NMMU's Department of Journalism, Media, and Philosophy. Uh, prior to joining the University of Western Cape, Prof. Sasanti worked for UNISA um, in their Institute for African Renaissance Studies, and he has multiple published works, both in accredited journals, as well as the author of two books. Um, I think I will leave it there so as not to waste much time, but there's far more that could be said. Uh, please join me in giving him a, well, a warm welcome, as well as eager ears and minds. Professor Sandy, over to you. Ngokubawungumtali <laughs> Is <laughs> I would like to extend my greetings to everyone who is here 
and uh, particularly appreciate that uh, the director of Conrad, Dr. Alan Zin, uh, warmed up to the idea for me to come over here together with his colleague, uh, Mr. Sonwa Mostirman, and all the colleagues of Conrad who made this possible. And I'd also like to appreciate and um, extend my uh, thank you note to Professor Pamela Maseko for having agreed to be a um, respondent to this. She's going through a hard time, but even in spite and despite of that, uh, she came forward and did not set this aside. And I've noticed also that in the Pan-African family, one of our beautiful intellectuals in the diaspora, Dr. Tiffany is here, who wrote a beautiful paper on Marfilis Ntandala about two, three years ago, if I remember well, and published it in our journal, the International Journal of African Renaissance Studies. So to all of you colleagues and everyone else who's here, please, the fact that I've mentioned a few by name uh, does not mean that uh, one is more important than the other. Allow me then to begin this uh, presentation by saying that um, in 1949, the apartheid government headed by the Nationalist Party set up the Eastland Commission named after its then Secretary for Native Affairs, Werner Eastland, to produce a blueprint for education for natives as a separate race and race being used um, by Lodge in this case, um, having declared that um, I do not uh, subscribe uh, to the existence um, of many races, but I subscribe to the existence of one that is the human race. But those who think otherwise, of course, uh, subscribe to the view that there are many races. And so the so-called the African race being uh, one of those. Published in 1951, among the SLN Commission's reports guiding principles were the recommendation that um, in inverted commas, Bantu culture and increased use of African languages constitute what was to be later known as Bantu education. In his book, The Rise and Dismise of the Afrikaners, the African historian and academic Herman Gilomier notes that despite its flaws, Bantu education signaled the introduction of a modern system of mass primary education for Blacks. Further, Gilomier observes that for 20 years after the, its introduction, the new system encountered little Black opposition with black parents failing to heed the ANC's call for school boycotts. This opposition, Cleomir further points out, late 1970s, after the policy had been adapted to enable large numbers of black children to advance to much higher standards than was possible in the preceding decades. Contrary to Cleomir's argument, in this presentation, we argue that Africans waged not a little black opposition to Bantu education, but a vigorous widespread struggle. As Tom Lodge in his book, Black Politics in South Africa since 1945, points out, the Bantu Education Act of 1953 was vigorously opposed to the South, by, in the South African press, various public platforms, and by some white and many black opposition politicians. Even though, as Lodge further notes, opposition to Bantu education did not succeed in arousing much popular participation, there were instances in which opposition to Bantu education did transform into a popular movement. These instances, as Lodge correctly points out, included what was then known as the Transvaal and the Cape provinces now known as the Gauteng Eastern and Western Cape provinces. The earliest concerted resistance to Bantu education, unsurprisingly, uh, Lodge further notes out, came from that group mostly affected and most sensitive to their implications, the teachers. The teachers' resistance came mainly from two teachers' organizations, the Cape African Teachers Association, known as CATA, and the Transvaal African Teachers Association no, known as Tata. In pursuing our argument that African people did not wage a little black opposition to Bantu education, as Khilomir suggests, we are going to point out that in waging resistance to Bantu education, African teachers mobilized the African masses, particularly the parents of children who were the targets of Bantu education. In this struggle, Phyllis Ndandar, an African woman political activist 
as a member of Qatar, was one of the leaders. In her company, there were other African women who waged a courageous struggle against Bantu educations, whose names, as we will see later, Ndandala noted down in the records of history. Now, we move to Bantu education as a political tool. Bantu education was meant to be a political instrument in effecting discrimination against African children. In disguising this fact, the Aislinn Commission promote, proposed the promotion of Bantu culture and African languages in African education from the first year up to standard five. Reflecting on this recommendation, Khiliomir suggests that Aislinn had a great respect for the culture of Blacks and genuine concern about the preservation of Bantu languages. This is supposed to be the case, according to Khiliomir, because the Aislinn Commission dismissed the idea that there were inherent differences between whites and Blacks in intellectual ability, further pointing out that the report strongly argued that the education for Blacks had to be tied to a Bantu culture and a Bantu society. Contrary to Hilomir's claim, the Aislinn Commission report was not, if at all, just about respecting Bantu and Bantu culture. Instead, African children's education was being used as a political tool to counter the English people's cultural hegemony amongst African people. This can be fully appreciated when taking into consideration two issues. The first is that there was a relationship between, on the one hand, tying Bantu education to a Bantu culture and a Bantu society. On, on the other hand, the um, Henry Fervul, the Minister of Native Affairs Observation in Parliament in 1953, that education should have its roots entirely in the native areas and in the native environment and in the native community. The Bantu must be guided to serve his own community in all respects. Ah. There is no place for him in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. Within his own community, however, all doors are open. This attitude was consistent with the National Party's government's policy known as the Bantustan homeland system, aimed at confining Africans to certain so-called homeland states recognized as citizens of those homelands. Thus, Africans being denied the citizenship in the rest of African people's own country. The second is that while on the one hand, the Afrikaners denied African children secondary education, on the other hand, the English missionaries were educating nine secondary school pupils per, per missionary. The truth of the matter though, is that even this gesture on the part of the English missionaries was no act of genuine of generosity to the African people. It was a Eurocentric project of the English missionaries' education, which stressed westernization and the central importance of good command of the English language. So the insistence of the Afrikaners on Africans being taught in African languages, good as that may have been, had nothing to do with Africans' welfare, but about Afrikaners undermining the spread of English cultural influence. Among the Afrikaners, many man manifestations of using education as a political act of preserving their identity and destroying Africans, I'm going to cite two. The first is the establishment of the University of Stellenbosch, an institution where I taught that was unmistakably Africans. The political identity of the US can best be understood if its historical background is taken into cognizance. The university was established amidst a language struggle in higher education, where in South Africa in the early 20th century, except for the College of Porches Rome, all universities' colleges in South Africa used English as the medium of instruction. An idea was that a single university using English as the medium of instruction was doing the rounds. The objective was to bring the Afrikaners and English together and thereby to 
strengthen imperial ties. Of great significance is that two mining magnates, Julius Wenner and Otto Bate, offered a substantial grant. They insisted on English as the medium of instruction as a means of attracting the best academic talent from Britain. At Stellenbosch, a town constituting a large community of Afrikaners, a stiff opposition built up against this proposal. It was in Stellenbosch where there existed the Victoria College, which had for many years been intimately connected with the spiritual, moral, and national life of the Dutch-speaking section of the people. Early in 1913, a community of three, which included D.F. Malan, an African leader who became South Africa's prime minister on the ticket of apartheid, spearheaded by the National Party, in 1948 penned a memorandum which described the proposed English university as an institution artificially called into being for political and other reasons. The Stellenbosch Afrikaner community wanted the Victoria College um, to, and the government of the day, the cabinet, is, the cabinet withdrew its support for a single teaching university. However, the plan for a university in Cape Town would go ahead while on the other hand, the government insisted that Victoria College had to raise 100,000 pounds publicly before it would agree to a university in Stellenbosch. Significantly, in 1915, a Stellenbosch businessman and politician, Jan Marais, left an amount of 100,000 pounds, not without stipulating that Dutch or Afrikaans had to occupy no lesser place than English at the institution. In line with Marais' stipulation, by 1930, virtually no lectures were given in English. And in line with being a university with an idea, between 1919 and 1978, all the prime ministers were US, or other, in other words, University of Stellenbosch alumni. The second manifestation of education being used as a political, as a political tool is that in 1974, South Africa's Department of Education instructed schools in Soweto and other townships in Southern Transvaal to teach mathematics and social studies through the medium of Africans in Standard 5 and upwards studying in 1975. And those in this kind of report will remember that uh, that is how the, the, the massacre of 1976 of the children um, mm. took place so much. You muted, you muted, Prof. So I've unmuted myself again. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. It said the host <laughs> muted me. So now we move on to African teachers' mobilization against Bantu education and, and the role in which Ndadala played a significant role. Reflecting on Carter's attempts to mobilize public um, opinion, Lodge notes that such moves were unusual for an African professional body. A brief historical background for contextual purposes is important with reference to the Cape African Teachers Association one of the organizations that led resistance to Bantu education and of course, uh, of which, to which Ndandala was a member. To begin with, a reference to the Cape province before the democratic dispensation in 1994 referred uh, in South Africa included both the Eastern and the Western Cape, which are now two separate entities. Qatar was formed in 1925 as an exclusively African organization breaking away from the multiracial South African Teachers Association. African teachers within SATA felt that they were treated as a kitchen department in that all matters pertaining to them were never given serious consideration by the organization and were always table last on the agenda. While this break was, in Tantala's view, a progressive step, she was unhappy with how Carter became elitist drawing its membership only from the teachers in the African Ivy League schools, the big cities and a few friends of these elite in the rural areas. In the 1930s, Carter degenerated in Tantala's words 
into a social club for the elite and the important items on the body's agenda became receptions and tennis matches. In the 1940s, there was an improvement in the new members who saw themselves as part and parcel of the community in which they lived. Um, a joint and another joint. Now, but even then, there were some who insisted that uh, the professional should remain professional and not political. Following Carter's annual conference held in Port Elizabeth in 1945, some members complained that some, with some, some fellow members were trying to bring politics into the organization by having the nerve to ask conference to allow IB Tabata, an avowed politician from Cape Town, to address them. That request was refused because the teachers knew that Tabata would speak nothing but politics. The majority still felt that politics was something outside their calling as teaching and therefore outside their organization. They were professionals and wanted to keep Carter that way. In 1946, Carter's membership accepted after engaging in a discussion that African teachers had to take the responsibility of being leaders of thought in the committee. And this is very interesting that, uh, you know, some of us who have been um, in struggles recently, um, when we sound very intelligent and speak about thought leadership, we think that uh, this idea of thought leadership um, was something that came with us very recently. Um, but no, already at that time, uh, the intentionalists and them were speaking about thought leadership. So uh, we should have some uh, humility and modesty and understand that, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we didn't know that these things um, existed, uh, that is not the same as them having not existed. It was in the midst of this elevated political consciousness of Qatar that the Iceland Commission emerged. While Qatar decided not to appear before the commission, the organization drew up a memorandum dated April 16, 1948, which it submitted to the commission. And it stated, we repeat that uh, the fundamental guiding principle in education should be to equip every individual to take his place in society according to his capabilities and make his contribution to it as a fully responsible citizen. All the inhabitants of the Union of South Africa should receive the same facilities for education. All the children, irrespective of race, color, or creed, should be um, regarded as its future citizens. Knowledge is the heritage of mankind. In 1950, Carter, with the All African Convention, confronted the South African government by challenging new provincial, provincial legislations which sought to impose a quota system on, on schools in order to ease overcrowding, a move that threatened to exclude 30,000 pupils in the Eastern Cape. When in 1951, the Iceland Commission published its recommendations, Carter took it upon itself to mobilize parents to oppose Bantu education. In a meeting that was held jointly by Carter and parents at Langa Hall, at Langa Hall in Cape Town, the following resolutions were made. The children shall continue attending school, the lodging being that even Bantu education was better than no education at all that teachers remain in their posts, teaching children that what, what was right as opposed to the poison that a, a bandu education would require them to administer to African children. That the fight against bandu education being the fight for parents. Parents will refuse to cooperate and collaborate with the government in the elections of school boards and school committees to run the bandu education schools that all Quislings and those collaborating with the apartheid government be ostracized in the African communities. Now, this, this was very striking for me um, in, in, in two respects. The, the first one was the fact that teachers um, took a leading role and that parents um, decided that they were going to be the ones who waged this struggle. Um, it was very interesting for me because I recall um, the, around the year 2015, seeing young people of this country who call themselves the roads must fall and later the, the fees must fall. I was watching the students and I was looking at them and they were on their own. 
um, fighting battles. And at that time, as an academic um, um, in an institution of filing, I was at the Nelson Mandela University at the time, um, I was terribly haunted. And I remember, you know, there's a song by Miriam Akeb. It says, that song, you know, by Miriam Akeba haunted me because as, as an academic um, that was in a university, seeing children running around and not doing anything haunted me. And, and I was thinking about it that um, I, I knew that um, if um, um, I, I were to participate in one way or the other, um, I would be perceived as an irresponsible agitator and all of that. And so in order to ease my conscience, um, I would always walk along and see them moving this way and that way, trying to negotiate with the police, not to beat them and all of that. And of course, those, um, you know, some of our colleagues, I, I, I realized that um, this was reported to my seniors. Um, and I recall at that time, the DVC, uh, Professor Dennis Zinn uh, said to me, uh, Simpua, thank you very much uh, for the role uh, that you played um, during the activities of the struggle. And I knew that Professor Zinn was not there at the time when I was negotiating between the police. So I knew that the report was given to Professor Zinn that I was there. But fortunately for me, Professor Zinn um, was approving and smiled. And so um, what then is significant for me was that, you know, at, at that time, not only was it the teachers, but the parents were involved. And I was, I, I continue witnessing struggles in this country where the students um, are on their own um, and that we, the academics, you know, especially the ones that are regarded as progressive, um, we keep a safe distance, but then thereafter we write papers um, about the, the roads must fall and the fields must fall. And um, those papers are published and of course we get promotion, um, but um, we kept many of us a very safe distance, but I'm aware that in some institutions, um, you know, some academics move um, move forward and, and address the students and engage. Um, and I, I have great respect for those who, who did so. The, the resolution to continue to send children to school, even though Bantu education was referred to as poison and the singling out of collaborators and quizlings were made against particular backgrounds. In the first instance, the decision to continue sending children to school was in opposition to a resolution taken by the African National Congress that all children except those already in standard five and above should be withdrawn from school. When Carter had a, held a conference at the end of the year 1953, it resolved to adopt the above resolutions of the parent-teacher organization of the Western Cape. For three full years, 1955 through to 1957, the authorities tried without success to get the people to elect school board and school committees members. So it cannot be true, therefore, um, that um, you know there was little black opposition as Khlomier would like us to believe. Alarmed by Qatar's effectiveness, the South African government reacted by withdrawing recognition from Qatar, bestowing it to the newly elected established um, Cape African Teachers Union Qatar. In 1951, the same year that the ACLN Commission's report was released, leaders of Tata at Orlando High School began to campaign quite effectively along the reef, organizing meetings of teachers and parents to explain and condemn the findings of the ACLN Commission. This is a very important point, again, to note that, um, um, you know, the same way that Tata uh, mobilized both teachers and parents uh, Tata too did the same thing. Um, and something that um, I think is considerably missing in our day, um, for one reason or the other, you know, um, our, the, the African parents of, uh, are, are very much, um, you know, at a distance and not directly involved in the struggle um, of, um, of, this, of the students and um, the, 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 the professionals as well you know, um, are, 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 are holding a very particular, you know, uh, diplomatic position. As if in anticipation of Khilomier's analysis, later, Lodge points out that the success of the boycott, its testimony 
uh, to their effectiveness in, is this in arousing parental concern at the threatened changes. Tata's leaders, such as his president, Zefania Mutuping, his secretary, Eskiam Patele, and the editor of the association's then general, Isaac Matale, traveled during school vacations to various districts in the province to crusade against the recommendations of the ACLN report. It is significant to know that it was teachers who decided to wage a struggle against Bantu education. As professionals, they could have chosen to ignore what was coming and take a safe route to protect their pockets. In fact, some teachers did turn a blind eye. As Mpatele observes, teachers had not long before gained a substantial rise in salaries for what the rise was worth, and they couldn't afford to risk their jobs by openly sympathizing with them. Teachers like Mpatele took the position they did fully conscious that it was fraught with the risks. As Mpatele notes, the principal of Orlando High School, where Mpatele taught, warned them that they had children to feed, that it would not do them good to be sacked, further warning them that they were heading for it if they did not stop talking politics. Clearly, the principal held the view that education and politics were two separate issues and had to be treated as such. It will be seen later that this position was held by other African teachers in other parts um, of South Africa. Failure on the part of Tata's leaders to heed the principal's warning did indeed lead to job losses. Notices of dismissal did come and there were no reasons given since conditions of employment in the case of African teachers were such that a dismissed person cannot contest the case in court and the education department is not bound to give reasons for its action. As if that was not enough, the notice stated that they were bound barred from teaching in any South African school. The fired teachers were soon to learn that the long term arm of the apartheid system reached far beyond the borders of South Africa. When Patella applied for a teaching post in the then Bechwana Land Protectorate, a British High Commission territory now known as Botswana, a reply came informing him that communication had reached them from the Provincial Department of Education that Mpatele had been dismissed for subversive activities. When Matlare went to teach in the then Swaziland Protectorate, now known as Eswatin, the security branch of South Africa visited the school a day and a day after he was given a summary notice by the school authorities to leave. Ultimately, in 1953, both Mutuping and Patele found work in one high school in the then Basuto land protectorate now known as Lesotho. Even then, the apartheid South African government made its presence felt in Lesotho. Mpatele notes that a report about their subjective activities reached Lesotho, um, but nothing came out of it. In addition to leaving their families behind, the salary offered in Lesotho was almost half of what African teachers were paid in South Africa, only a little higher. Banned from teaching in South Africa, um, Patele left the country to take up a teaching post in Nigeria. He took this decision after organizing debates with himself, torn by seeing the condition of the African children under the new system and living instead of fighting it out side by side with those whose children were also being brought up in a police state. It must be pointed out that Tata member's journey was not a lonely one. The fired teachers at Orlando High School received support from students' parents. A protest, a parents' protest committee organized a school boycott and established a people's school for boycotters. As a consequence of the two month long school boycott, less than a third of the school student attended classes, meaning that the protest action apparently gained a wide local support. While on the one hand, the struggles and suffering of male African teachers like Mpatele are well recorded and noted. Struggles of female African teachers are either little known or not known at all. While on the one hand, Mpatele's book Down Second Avenue is widely read in South Africa and has enjoyed being prescribed in some high schools, Ntantala's book, A Life Mosaic, the autobiography of Phyllis Ntantala is little known or not known at all. 
Yet, Ntandala's book is a treasure piece of work that has not only meticulously recorded struggles of resistance against Eurocentric education in South Africa, but has also captured the struggles against Eurocentric education by African American Americans, by African Americans in the USA. The book enables us to understand how African people, both in South Africa and the USA, utilized institutions set up by their oppressors and institutions set up by themselves to advance types of education that would serve African interests. Now, uh, we, we take uh, into context uh, Ndandala's political awakenings. Ndandala's awake political awakenings went through at least three phases. The first was during her last days as a student at Forte. The second was when she went to Kronstadt as a teacher where her anger was roused by a student's condition, whose hopes and ambitions seemed to end in a cul-de-sac, leading her to ask why and seek answers to the problems of poverty that threatened the ambitions of such good students. The third phase was when, she, was when she went to live in Cape Town, when she learned that what was responsible for human misery was capitalism, a system of exploitation that benefited only a few and saw the rest of mankind as units of labor that could be exploited for the benefit of those few who held economic power. She came to the conclusion that not until this system of exploitation of men by men had been smashed and disbanded could there be freedom in the world. Realizing that she could not leave it to others to destroy this exploitative system, she decided to join the liberation struggle in order to create a new world, a human world of free, liberated people. And these are their own words, a new world, a human world of free, liberated people. At Forte, together with a number of other students, Ndandala began to question some of the things they were taught. This led them to come out with the slogan, South African history is a lie. While they did not have all the facts to prove their statement, they somehow knew that South African history was like the story of an animal hunt that glorified only the actions of the hunters and said nothing or very little about the heroism and, strat and strategies of the hunted. The early history she had learned from her father taught her that the African people had been cheated and robbed. But even then, the reasons for this wholesale robbery had not been clear. It was during her time in Kronstadt as a teacher that things began to be clear to her as she witnessed poverty, poverty, poverty all around, especially among the students she was teaching. So poverty stricken was this community that even though school fees were low, few could afford to pay them. Even then, Ntantala would recall that she had yet to see children as hungry for education as those African students she had taught in Kronstadt. And, and she, she says, I quote her, they liked school, liked their schoolwork and became lovers of books, literature and everything that stimulated their mind. And yet many of them came from illiterate and semi-illiterate homes where the parents did not even read a newspaper, let alone her book. The students' attitude to their education earned them a place in Tandana's heart, as she recalls, I loved those students and they loved me in return. To, to each of them, I was Mistress Waka, my teacher, instead of Mistress Waruna, our teacher. Nothing flattered me more than that. However, I went back and met some of them. They would tell me they had named their daughters Phyllis after me. Ndandala, an Isikosa speaking African from the Eastern Cape, embraced and drew her students even closer to her by learning to and speaking their language, Southern Sisutu, a move that had an electrifying effect on the students. The students liked this and excitedly they would say, she knows Sutu, she knows Sutu. As she looked at a class of 40 to 45 students, 
knowing that of these only about 10 could say for certain what they would that they would go beyond what our school gave she often asked herself why but why she was sensitive to her people's needs and situation because she had been brought up in a home where the destitute always came for help while the students she had studied with in educational institutions like Hilltown, Lovedale, and Fort Hare had known from primary school their educational destiny. Most of her students in Skronskat did not see any future for themselves beyond their school. They remained the school because it was a good place, better than life in the location. Ndantala's instinct told her that something was wrong somewhere. But what it was, she had not figured out. Figure it out she did in 1942, after listening to a white lawyer, Herman Basner, addressing the Free State African community in a public meeting where he was availing himself to be their parliamentary representative since Africans in apartheid South Africa at the time were denied this right. In the meeting, Basner told the attentive African community that it was unjust that Africans were poor and that their children were starving. Yet it was their labor that built the economy of South Africa. Basna told the gathering that he was not asking the community to give them their votes so that he could represent them in parliament because he did not think that there was much he could do for the Africans in that situation since he pointed out it was Africans alone who could do that for themselves the, themselves the day that they could gain the right to enter parliament buildings. What Basna was asking for, he told the Africans, was that with their votes, he could have the mandate to go around the farms, factories and mines, telling African people in this country, his constituency, that they alone can right the wrong against them. That united as a body of workers, the creators of the wealth of South Africa, they can grind to a halt that economic machinery of South Africa, that they can bring down the whole system. Recalling this occasion, Ndandala notes, open quote, that night in June 1942 at the Basna meeting, I obtained the answers to some of my questions. I knew where my place would be in the South African setup. I understood even this, that the slight racism of places like the Cape Province, Lovedale and Forte, which I thought were free from the racial attitudes. I understood some of the reasons behind promoting an allied among African people and why the first graduates of Forte were so elitist in their attitudes. Though born and brought up in that milieu, I would try to shed those attitudes and involve myself in the struggle of my people. In the Orange Free State province, where teachers like that, just like in the then Transvaal province, were not treated as professionals, Basna's candidacy awakened the teachers and mobilized them. This awakening resulted in the Orange Free State African Teachers Association of SATA and the Transvaal African Teachers Association starting to look critically at their contracts and their conditions of service. Teachers in the Orange Free State, including some farm teachers, at great list to their lives and jobs were organized to join OSATA. The result being that in March 1943, teachers in Bloemfontein staged one of the biggest demonstrations ever held in the city by Africans protesting against the new service contract that had just been drawn up. Ndandala marched with the teachers to the offices of the Secretary of Education. When the teachers got there, the Secretary of Education's assistant came out with a new service contract trying to tell the teachers that this was the best ever in the whole country, whereupon Joey Jacobs grabbed it out of his hand, tore it to pieces, and threw the pieces into his face. In 19 August 1944, Ntantana's husband, A.C. Jordan, was offered a lecturing post at Fort Hare University, resulting in her and the children relocating from Kronstadt to Alice. The opportunity to go to Fort Hare, where both Ntantala and Jordan had been students before, was an exciting moment for Ntantala. Declarations such as going back permanently to our forte and intellectual center reveal her unmistakable affinity with the institution and high levels of enthusiasm and expectations about her future in and with the institution. 
soon after their arrival in the institution, her enthusiasm was dampened. She saw Forte as a little island where the inhabitants lived a life of their own, completely unaware of what was going on in the world around them. While Fortes had a multiracial staff, it was a predominantly white staff. In an expression clearly marked by disappointment, Ntantala observes that the few Africans who taught at Forte were the most frightened people she had ever had the misfortune to meet. While the African lecturers were not happy about the discrimination there, they spoke of it in whispers for fear of losing their jobs. With a sense of disgust and contempt, Ndandala notes that the whole atmosphere stank. The conversation among both the academics and the students with some exceptions were about the weather, sports, movies, the war, without any depth, all the things that intellectuals in their ivory towers talk about. This sense of frustration on the part of Ndandala was informed by the fact that their lives in the Orange Free State had brought them to, to them the disabilities of the African people, leading to her and Jordan making the choice to be part of that section of our people that was struggling for liberation. A practical expression of this choice was joining the African National Congress and of SATA, of which Jordan was the president. She and Jordan held the view that as teachers, they are to play a political role in African communities. Active resistance to combining politics with education was also expressed by 40 lecturers, both black and white. This resistance emerged when in May 1945, Jordan gave a public lecture on the ethics of war of the Bantu. Focusing on the clashes between Africans and European colonial intruders, Jordan interpreted each episode from the point of view of the Africans, the lions this time telling their own story, an act which made an indelible impression on the students. The students were electrified because there was an African, here was an African who was not afraid to interpret African history as it should be. Jordan had taken a conscious position to present an African history told from the point of view of the African people, the history that one seldom finds in books written by historians of the conquerors. By the time of, this, of, his, he was, of his death, he was keenly sought after by the students of African history in South Africa, Europe, and in the United States of America. While on the one hand, the students were excited, on the other hand, some of his fellow African colleagues were embarrassed and consequently shunned him and his wife, meeting them only when necessary. As for the four-day old guard, the white liberals were shocked. I've reached the end of my time, which was 40 minutes, and the last five minutes that were generously given to me um, by Professor Maseko, I would like uh, to note that, um, you know, in conclusion, since the focus was um, uh, with reference to, to African women in particular. Uh, Dantala held very strong views regarding the need for particular recognition and appreciation, and appreciation of women's role in the liberation struggle, women's role in leadership, leader, role leadership in political struggles in general, and women's leadership role in education struggles in particular. When in 1974, she was in England and was invited by some South African women to address them on the platform, problems faced by women in South Africa. Thinking that the subject had been exhausted, she felt that there was one major topic that the liberation movement needed to face. And that was the question of women within that movement. In her view, the question of women in the liberation struggle was a subject that the movement had not begun to address and that unless the movement addressed this question and did so honestly, the liberation movement was bound to fail and would have failed the women who had given so much of their energy, time, and in some cases, their lives to the struggle for the liberation in their country. In line with the convictions outlined above, she has recorded for posterity, recorded women's struggles in her biography. Ndandala has noted that at the Cape African Teachers Association Conference in 1953, young people requested her to address the gathering so as to give courage to other women in the conference. Driven by the conviction 
that the fight against Purdue Abandu education was a fight for the mothers of the nation, and that if they stood firm, they could defeat its ends, Ndandala obliged. The foregoing observations give a clear indication that African women participated in the struggles against Bantu education, not simply as African parents, but female African parents, not simply as Africans, but African women. It was this appreciation that led Dantala's colleagues, Ronnie Seagal, to invite her to write an article, a story of an African woman in a maiden name for Africa South. Rising to the occasion, Ndandala took a conscious decision to write about African women about whom nothing was heard, whose story had never been told. Reflecting on a consciously pro-African women stance, Ndandala was glad that she had opened the windows on these women. Before that, no one had thought their story was worth telling. Other articles that she wrote for Africa South were included in the, in the series and abyss of Bandu education. As a result of a deliberate pro-African women stance, through her book, A Life's Mosaic, the autobiography of Antil Sintanta, we now know about brave African women's names, such as Annie Seling, a veteran fighter and opponent of every anti-African war. Another daring woman who was vociferous in parents' meetings discussing Bantu education was Winisikwa. In these struggles, women played leading and prominent roles informed by African perspectives, which taught that every mother is every child's mother. Jombengkul, apu koyo pagatiko koko betu kwele mimoi. Ndizambile kanga ngoke na kukwe ndia tembu ba ukolila pukoi. Ndiseza futi, ndizame futi, ndo kukuba manikubekeke. Ndenze kanga ngoke na ako. Ndo kukuba iga malako malkunjulwe, malaziwe, na misa benze mihle, kwe nzileyo, kukuba mayaziwe. Stulingo memnandi, singa bandwana abasele wanga senza. Eti nguma malo, osi zala yo, nguma ma, osi zala yo, nguma ma, osi zeleyo. Unga kange ube osi zele, ngomzimba, nanginyamu. Osi zele, ngokuwa se ngundwini, osi zele, ngokuwa se mwenye. Sia kwa zba na mtlanje, uba stegete, ngotobe stegete angalo. Kengwa nduko kwa wakwe nsekeza, uza kutuwa ila lembe, ukonukuze siya zlembali, ote waishia. Ukwenze ndoba, siso kwa zupiki sana, na baitwe ndoko kwa banga chiki mbali, yetu, esoni peke ngo shobu. Batete unga ti, nina ningo koko betu, nina bazal betu, zange ni ime, ni luela bandwa na beni. Niba luele abandwa na betu, abaseti, itabilona, lisa kubeta, kama kushi, kwele mimoya, nyes pamandla, genje njalo kekuli na onke, mkoko bamo, ebe nite, dinete mlo wabe niku nina londo, nkasha kwe na, eso gani njalo, kama tongu mtali, ungu mtali wa koko betu, ungu mtali wetu, ungu mtali wa bandwa na betu, ungu mtali wa sulu wa nesuzai, kama kushi. Prof. Maseko, note that I ended exactly at the fifth minute that you gave me. It's strange that they say Africans have no concept of time. Thank you very much, Program Director. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Sasanji, for what I believe has been an incredible journey into um, the history of Bantu education into this country, but also of political agency on the part of various parties within the education system. Um, I think it was pertinent that you closed off with um, quite a rousing um, perspective on the political awakenings of Mama Dandala in her journey um, to uh, political conscientization, which is very an incredible part of our history. I won't be long um, in that. I think we'll have more to say once we get into the question and answer session. But for now, I'll, I'll introduce Professor Maseko who is currently the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at Nelson Mandela University, and also the former Executive Dean of Humanities at Northwest University. She is currently co-editing a literature series, a literature series published at UK's Daily Press, um, dedicated to republishing newspaper writings. So oh, interesting of the capable in the early literature in the early 19th and 20th century. Uh, she's worked at both Rhodes University as well as UCT, and she's held fellowships at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies, as well as the Johannesburg Institute 
of advanced studies. Once again, I ask that we warmly welcome her with both our audience as well as our mind. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seti. Um, let me just acknowledge first the keynote uh, speaker for the day, my friend, uh, Prof. Sasanti. Um, I also saw um, that there is Alan and Dennis, um, and I wish to acknowledge um, them and Alan, particularly as representing management from Kendred. Um, and all colleagues who, who took time to be here today, um, thank you uh, very much. It's, it's um, late in the day, but you um, are uh, holding on. Uh, let me also take the time to thank Sonwabo for being patient with me, Sonwabo, especially in the last few weeks when I took time mostly to respond to your email. So thank you for your patience. Um, as you can imagine, colleagues, it's difficult <laughs> to, to, to really respond uh, or to be responding to Prof. Sasanti, um, uh, not only because of um, his um, deep insights into pan-Africanist um, uh, thinking, but also in the manner in which he presents um, um, his arguments around things. But let me um, thank you, Prof. Sasanti, for providing a historical context with um, a pan-Africanist thought, insights is, um, that can only be presented by you um, around uh, the Bantu Education Act. Um, I want to pick up just one um, or two um, issues that you raised earlier on, and I'll, I will then delve into what I've prepared, which is written down um, so that I don't take time. Um, and colleagues, please bear with me, um, this was prepared Paid without seeing um, the presentation from Professor Santi. So, but I, I, I hope that um, my presentation complements um, what, what he presented here because um, I focus more on um, Dandala and not so much on the history um, of fund education. But just um, the, the, the one um, um, aspect I want to pick up from your from your um, input earlier on, is um, how as Africans, we became vi victims of power dynamics between Afrikaners and the English. Um, if I picked you, um, if I understood you well, uh, Professor Santi, you are saying that the introduction um, of Bantu language and culture is, is core subjects in, in the Bantu education was really so that um, the Afrikaner can take, could take away from um, the, the, or rather take away the dominance of English that was becoming to really um, make inroads in um, black education. I think that's one thing for me that um, you, you giving me a sense that, uh, or thinking that no. it has never been about um, Afrikaner and, and, and the black population, but so much about Africans in English, but um, we can take that up um, uh, sometime. Um, the second one is the need for us to acknowledge the intellectual thoughts of those who came before us, um, even as we um, either drive on what they presented or continue with what they presented during their time, but um, your, your, your um, input around um, thought leadership um, and um, the, the issues around fees must fall. Um, keep on reminding us that these contestations don't come with us now, but they've been there long before us. And, and perhaps we should be uh, blaming ourselves as academics in these spaces or elite um, uh, for not engaging enough with those who came before us. Um, I'm not sure why that is so, either because we don't understand enough um, what they are thinking was, or um, we perceive their thinking as transgressive or we're comfortable with where we are now. Um, the last point I want to raise uh, around your, 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 your presentation is you, um, you, you said just one um, issue about Dandala being transgressive um, and and um, 
I want to just um, illustrate from what I know um, and read about her and the, the extent of her transgressions. Um, we know that from the early years, um, firstly, firstly, maybe let me point out that um, in reading um, her biography, I could pick up Prof. Sessanti, um, uh, who taught her um, to be transgressive. Um, is her grandmother who instructed her when she went to school that you must always speak up, lift, um, raise your hand, speak up and not cry. And so, um, and, and I think that that has been, um, um, uh, what's the right word, that, that has been uh, given at home, continued um, throughout her life. Um, and and we, I, I can um, um, highlight uh, three or four instances where she was transgressive. Firstly, um, uh, is turning down ACES, uh, AC Jordan's proposal um, and, and saying um, uh, openly that it's because of her age and obvious of his age. Obviously, we know that um, she turned around and, and they got married and had a happy life afterwards. But more explicit um, around um, apartheid is, is her transgression to apartheid segregationist policies, particularly her moving from Langa after AC had um, been appointed at UCT as, as a lecturer there and, and, and um, settling in Langa as a township that was um, designed for black people. And, and her moving from Langa and going to Ethlone, um, which was meant for, for colored population. And also um, her determination to send her children uh, to <clears throat> colored schools um, at the time that of course were, were, were segregationally um, arranged or racially um, segregated. So I, I hear a sound, I don't know if it's coming from me. Yeah. Okay. Can you so hear me? Sandra, can you please uh, mute yourself? Okay, thank, thank you so much. So, so, so those are just the, the few points I wanted to raise um, around Professor Santi's um, um, input before I, I, I go into what I've prepared. Um, um, the brutality of the 1953 Education Act um, is well known and, and has been articulated very well by Professor Santi. Um, and as we know, it is an act that we continue to attach blame to, rightfully so, for exclusion of Black society and all that they present in centers of power. Um, an opportunity to take seriously Black women's intellectual, political, and social, and other activities as part of historical processes in South Africa and specifically around this um, is important for our university, if not all universities in South Africa. It's important for us, um, um, especially as we are posi positioning ourselves in leading the unearthing of women intellectual histories to purposefully di diversify knowledge production processes in higher education. So, um, and, and this is also important given the intense contestations of our historical narrative, which as you know, privilege, um, privileges European dominated white supremacist, supremacist, supremacist and male In her ability to project women's voices and experience in a manner in a sedima, or dignified, as you would say in English, or that contest the widely held assumptions of, about Black woman, womanhood. She provides a narrative that um, of subjugated, um, she, she provides a narrative that contests, oh, sorry, sorry, let me repeat that. She provides a narrative beyond that of subjugated, powerless, and invisible women through the voices of the women themselves. So she gives the women's voices. She does not speak on their behalf. However, um, the one thing that stands out in, in, in this is, is the manner in which she diminishes her role, no matter how actively involved she has been, 
and chooses to showcase her ideological and political position through others. This is important, and I'll come back to it later when I talk about her relationship with the work um, of her partner and husband, A.C. Jordan. Going back to her, to her as the voice of Black women, I would like to lift uh, from the pages in her bio biography um, wherein she provides a narrative um, on the Iceland Commission. And, and some of this has been quoted by um, a Professor Santi. So pardon me for the repetition. Um, I'm fascinated by the manner in which she articulates verbatim women voices in meetings following the publications of the founding of the findings and the recommendations of the Iceland Commission. Voices that, in, that eventually determine the direction and outcome of meetings, of political meetings. I think that's important um, to, to, to emphasize that these voices are not just voices, but they are recognized and they give direction and, and provide outcomes of meetings. She states in her biography, for instance, in, in, in giving um, an, 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 um, a narrative about the meeting that Prof. Um, Sesante referred to, um, uh, she says that a big, stout, strong woman talked down Mr. Mapisa, who was advocating for boycotting of classes. And, and I quoted a big, stout, strong woman here, because she's, for me, she's showing the strength um, of the woman and the ability to talk down um, someone who is male and is representing that male power. So she talked her down. Um, and, and, and Mr. Mapisa was advocating for boycotting of classes following the recommendations of the um, um, ANC conference um, held um, after the Iceland Commission recommendation. Sandala states um, that with the words um, that this woman articulated. So uh, the woman said, Daddy, sit down. We have children and we are not here to listen to your nonsense. So Dagi had no voice, but to, rather Dagi had no choice, but to withdraw and sit down, allowing the meeting to continue in discussion that resulted in the disapproval of an ANC conference resol resolution that all children, except those already in standard five and above, be withdrawn from school. So the three women that uh, Dandala quotes um, here um, is Francina, Mampanya, Winnie Sikwana, and Dina or Dina Mambila. Um, and they, sp they speak openly um, uh, against the res resolutions in a manner that depicts the strength and resoluteness of women as I've known uh, them, on, especially on matters uh, impacting society especially um, children's education. The disapproval of the ANC conference resolution is captured in Winnie Sikwana's statement that is um, um, articulated uh, by Ndandala in her biography. Um, Winnie Sikwana says, I'm amazed that the ANC, an organization of African people, we should know if it does not, that education is the only hope for African people have is the only hope the African people have through which they hope to liberate themselves someday could ever come up with such a resolution. I've lived in this location, meaning Langa, for years, and I think I can say I know the wishes of the mothers here about the education of their children. I can say the same about all those fathers in the barracks and bachelor's uh, quarters, and people who um, are from Langa will know um, the barracks and, and the quarters. Every one of them wishes to see his children educated. Go to the mines, the farms, the rural areas. There is not a single African parent who does not wish to see his or her child educated to be in a better position than the parent. How then can the ANC, an organization of all these people, call upon them to do what they know the people will never do? It is the robust discussion of women at the meeting that captures um, that, that, that Ndandala captures, and that leads to a new resolution that stands to counter the previous ANC conference resolution um, to boycott schooling. 
And, and again, uh, Sensanti has captured these. Um, and so three resolutions is that um, the parents continue to send their children uh, to school for a child with even boundary education is better than a child with no education at, at all. Uh, Professor Santi has uh, said that. What's of interest for me um, here is resolution two, um, wherein um, Dandala states that we call upon our teachers, parents call upon our teachers to stay in their posts, teaching our children what they know should be taught and they have been doing and that, that they've been doing over years. Our teachers are our hope for that they alone will counteract the poison of boundary education. We call upon our teachers to be vigilant, watching out for any signs in the content of what is to be taught that is not in the interest of our children. And the third resolution is that this fight is for us parents and, such, and as such we, the parents will refuse to cooperate and collaborate with the government in the elections of school boards. Um, as you know, that the, the um, Iceland Commission of the Band of Education required that um, the school boards be elected um, to manage schools on behalf um, of the um, department at the time. So I would like to highlight, um, as I've said, let me highlight the second point in, the, in, in this resolution. Ben Hooks, um, in her book, Teaching to Transgress, states that for black folks in the 1960s, obviously in, obviously in the States, teaching in, a, in racially segregate, segregated school setups was fundamentally a political act because it was rooted in anti-racist struggle and the schools became the location where learning was experienced as a revolution. For children, um, the, for, 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 in other words, for school children, that devotion to learning was a counter hegemonic act to resist white racist colonization. I admire the manner in which teaching to transgress, similar to Bell Hooks' narrative about the American experience in the 1960s, is captured in this, in this second resolution, where teachers are urged to remain in their position and teach what they know should be taught and that they remain at the hope of society to counteract any curriculum content that is not in the interest of children and that may poison the mind of the African child. The parents gave this responsibility to teachers to educate, to redefine education presented to a black child in a manner that disrupts the intention of apartheid education to train them as nothing more than hewers of wood and drawers of water. Um, whilst um, the boycott was unsuccessful, um, especially in the Western Cape, it is not in the scope of this presentation to give a view on the success of the call for transgressive teaching and, learn and learning. Um, I want to raise, um, um, before I conclude, um, I want to raise just a, a few points on Dandala's perceptions on the role of Black society in the education of Black child. Um, especially during the boundary education. And my, my, my thinking is that those, um, her perceptions still apply now um, at this point in our history. Um, so obviously I've, I've highlighted the role of black teachers um, in context of social injustice um, and racial opp oppression is to teach to be transgressive. Teaching as Bell Hooks put it, puts it, is about service and giving back to society. It is about nurturing black intellect so that a black child can become a scholar, a thinker in order to fulfill their intellectual destiny. It is um, to disrupt the narrative about black experience instead of continuously playing the script that has been given about black experience from the other. The second point um, is the voice of black parents. Um, from from um, what we, I see from Tantala's work, the voice of black parents is critical in determining the fate of their children's um, education. Their consciousness around the um, dehumanizing and exploitative intention of the bandit education and the cruel exercise of power by the apartheid um, government um, is important um, for, for it to be taken forward um, 
um, in terms of where we are um, now, once again. Um, the third point um, is the importance of the Black elite. Um, from um, her work, the Black elite is important in providing, only in providing a narrative on Black experience, especially Black working class women experience, given contestations about Black histories. Um, however, the role of Black elite is not to silence the working class voice or to make decisions um, on um, its behalf, but to be conduits of their knowledge as, kept, as captured in their life experiences. And we see this in two of um, the seminal works um, of um, uh, Ndandala, the women of the reserves and, and, and Black womanhood. Um, and how she, how she captures um, uh, uh, this and, and the way in which she does it with lots of grace and, and respect um, for the experience and thorough interpretation um, of, of, of Black experience. The last point um, uh, before I move to the next uh, part is, is the political unity, which is critical for the success of Black cause. Dandala states in a bi biography that the, the enemy is not the ANC, Azapo, Black Consciousness Movement, United Democratic Front, or any other people's organizations. The enemy is the oppressive system of South Africa, the government that has imposed it upon the people, the lackeys who operate the machinery. That is the enemy. So as, as I come towards the conclusion, I just want to, to, to just shift slightly from um, the, the Bantu education, um, although there is um, a kind of a relationship with what I'm about to say with um, education, but I just want to, to, to just share the relationship between Dandala and um, AC Jordan. Um, so um, through, um, this, I wish to expand on the point I made earlier on how Dandala diminish, diminishes her role on intellectual projects and chooses instead to showcase her position through others. As you would know, AC Jordan is the world renowned um, African literary and linguistic. He's known for his classical novel. Um, can I please ask, just because I see you on the screen. Okay, thank you so much. He's known for his classical novel, In Mumboye Minyanya, which, has, which was subsequently translated into English and Dutch. Um, um, and the, 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 the In Mumboye Minyanya was published in 1940 by Lovedale Press, um, obviously. And then uh, the practical course um, in Isikosa that um, he developed at UCT, it's a very pioneering work, um, as well, and this was published in 1966, as well as Towards African Literature in 1973, Tales from Southern Africa, also in 1973, and Quezo Bindo Zetita in 1974. What um, many um, African scholars or closer scholars and linguists don't know is that except for Ingombo um, Yeminyanya and the practical course in Isikosa, all of um, A.C. Jordan's works were published posthumously. Um, in the Phyllis Ndandala archives at, Na at Nahex, um, uh, no, sorry, I think it's A.C. Jordan archives at Nahex at 14, there is documentation um, of her pleas to Jordan's colleagues um, um, and publishers to keep A.C. Jordan's voice alive. In her biography, her, relation, her relationship with Jordan is captured um, as um, thus. AC was an, intellect, was an intellectual life and he involved me. AC's life was an intellectual life, pardon me, and he involved me in his intellectual pursuits. As colleagues and friends, he encouraged me, stimulated me as he grew, I grew with him. In the end, we were not just husband and wife, but intellectual friends and colleagues. For this, I'll forever be grateful. But I, I was literally moved when reading some of her correspondence. In one address to the organizing committee of a conference on ethnography and folklore in 1969, she writes, 
it is with deep regret. Um, obviously, um, sorry for lacking the context here. She, she writes in response to an in invitation that was sent to AC Jordan from um, a, a conference on ethnography from the organizing committee of the conference on ethnography in 1969. And as we all know, um, AC Jordan had died um, a year earlier. And so she writes to them um, in response, it is a great with deep regret that I inform you that Prof. Jordan is late. And she goes on to say, I'm certain that he would have loved to participate in your conference. I was wondering if I could send you one of his papers on this theme uh, of the conference, Tell, Teller and Audience in African Spoken Narratives. And uh, she concludes by saying, I'm at the moment working on an introduction to his collection of African folk tales in translation with a view to having them published. Understandably, their partnership moved beyond husband and wife, but I'm perplexed at how she reduces her role as only conduit in Jordan's literary publications. Um, I, I want to stop here uh, because of time, but um, I cannot leave this out. Um, I, I do want us to really think uh, deeply about our role um, in the academy um, in this time in our history as we try to recenter the voices that have been um, marginalized, um, either because of gender, um, political ideology, and so forth, and also voices that are, are self censoring uh, for whatever reason, such as that of. of um, um, Mama Phyllis and Dandan. Let me end the uh, end here, uh, Seto. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, uh, for an incredibly insightful um, response to Prof Sosanti's uh, lecture. Um, I'll be very brief so as to give people time to ask questions. I've already noted some comments and questions. Um, prof, you mentioned how um, Uman Dandala's role in magnifying an expansive narrative of African womanhood, in, which is otherwise hidden um, behind many figures, be they male, be they political movements, etc., as well as the role of Black elites as conduits um, for the voices of otherwise marginalized Black voices. Uh, I think these are very powerful uh, themes within your response, as well as that as teaching as transgression. I think that's also very powerful. I'd just like, before I move on to take more questions, I'd like to note comments that have been made in the um, in the chat box. Tiffany Caesar has agreed with Prof. Sasanti's um, view that you can't separate politics from education, as well as in agreement with Prof. Uh, Maseko's response. It's about magnifying the roles of teachers as political agents of change. Um, Nomandla has a question, actually, um, in which she asks, um, on the basis that uh, Umar Dandala has, in effect, been living under the shadow, one could put it, of uh, Professor A.C. Jordan, is that one of the reasons why um, it seems that there's been a lack of recognition for um, her scholarly contributions? Um, but before we go into getting more questions, Prof. Denise Zinn also wanted to thank both the speakers uh, for what she believes is important work to, to highlight the missing stories of African intellectual history, um, not only for the current, but also for future generations. Um, is there anyone else who would perhaps have uh, a question? I'll highlight Momanda's question. Her view that due to uh, Umanda Ndala being uh, under AC, Prof. A.C. Jordan's shadow, that, that has led to a lack of recognition of her scholarly contributions. Would any of the speakers like to contribute or speak to that? I, I'm not on them. Okay. Professor Sandy, would you like to start on that? And then. You know how much I love and respect women, um, Sister Pim. So you'll go first. It's it's not an um, for me. It's not an easy um, uh, 
question, uh, or, or I, I don't have a, a, a simple um, response to the question. Um, all of us um, are of the view that um, Dandala was a powerful um, woman. Um, and I am also puzzled by um, her, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's submissive, um, miss, but I'm puzzled by her not talking back um, or, or taking on um, her roles as an enabler um, of um, um, uh, Jordan's work. I'm not sure where the problem, what the problem is. Um, I, I note also that I was trying to find a section in the book, um, in the biography, where um, she is um, acknowledging um, Jordan as a speaker um, at, 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 at a conference and, her, um, uh, and his ability to capture the audience. Um, and so it, it speaks to someone who's in awe um, of the person, but also I think that has not um, contributed a lot coming out. Um, is the person who I think for me who is pivotal in having us now to be speaking about Jordan at this point in time. I don't think those wonderful works that um, I can see people in the chat um, from me. I know that who used um, his work on towards African literature, um, his work that um, started. Um, the work that I'm involved in, in identifying um, uh, literary activity of Black intellectuals um, in newspapers. Um, I don't think with, um, without um, Dandala, I don't think that work would have come out. And so the simple answer is that I'm not sure where the problem is. Um, so Prof, Prof, uh, Professor Sasanti may be able to assist. Professor Sandy, would you also like to contribute to, to that question on her living in the shadow? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the, my, my, my response is that, you know, on at two levels. The first one is that, um, you know, when we, the, the liberation struggle, for some reason, some comrades in the liberation struggle, um, consciously or otherwise, uh, put women at the back. You know, the struggle was referred to as a black man's struggle. Um, the land of our forefathers, as if the struggle was not both the black men's and women's struggle, as if the land was not the land of both our forefathers and foremothers. So as a result of that, whilst we black males have felt very comfortable with decolonization only as far as it addresses, you know, racism, we have been very um, uncomfortable with not addressing sexism. So I think it is in that context that the scholarship of Mandandala has not really been appreciated. Um, as I said in the paper, we know very much about the works of um, Eskiam Pasele, and these are prescribed. But the book by Phyllis Mandandala, which is going to be 30 years um, in existence, is not um, prescribed. And that is the effort we should make, all of us, in making sure that uh, she gets the deserved recognition. And directly to the question, um, Mantandala was um, very conscious of, no, of, of self not wanting to live. And I'm, I'm quoting it directly as she says, you know, um, I, I did not want to be an appendage, the beautiful smiling doll basking in my husband's, um, you know, glory. And uh, she said that she wanted to see so as an African female reader, writer, and tell, you know, all right, not as a, as, a, as, a, as a woman who, like many other African women political leaders, were made to live vicariously through their husbands. So when you read her autobiography, uh, she states very clearly where she had serious disagreements um, with AC Jordan and stuck to her point, even to the, to the discomfort and the unhappiness of AC Jordan. So she makes these uh, points very clearly. And in fact, you know, uh, made it very clear to him what she would accept and what she would not accept. And uh, she stuck by that um, very, very, so we, we know. And so when she um, uh, appreciates the, the work of AC Jordan, it is simply that an appreciation. 
um, but not at the expense or you no know, diminishing herself in order to to elevate um, uh, Jordan. She was not that kind of a person. She she refused. So, but so again, in conclusion, the the fact that we do not we do not have an appreciation has got to do with the fact, uh, to a large extent, of um, a male-dominated academia where we push ourselves and fellow males and seek to relegate women uh, for, for, for some reason. Thank you very much, Prof. Sasanti. I think that um, Prof. Uh, Ellen Zinn agrees with you in saying that she was certainly not <laughs> submissive in expressing her thoughts. Um, both as an anti-capitalist um, campaigner, as well as in her critique of post-apartheid uh, South Africa. Um, Tiffany, you said you would like to contribute to the discussion before we move on to other questions. Thank you so much. I also would just like to agree with um, the previous comments and just say that I'm very grateful to be on this wonderful um, discussion. I've um, just added so much more things to think about as I, um, piece her life together. I do just want to uh, kind of read this comment in her chapter on, um, in her chapter of her autobiography called Coming Through. And she says, what a pity many women are placed in, the, in this position to live vicariously through their husbands. As a result, there are many whose contributions to mankind have been stunted and the world is the loser. And so um, she writes her autobiography um, um, just explaining how she feels. And I will also like to agree that um, I don't think she was hiding behind um, her husband's um, identity and his intellectual, um, I guess, proudness. Um, and I also would like to say that I feel that there is another political phase we can add to her. And I would say that's a political phase four in which she does po more political writing and activism in the United States. While she was in the United States, she campaigned against the anti-apartheid movement. She toured um, historically black colleges, um, discussing the challenges men and women were having in the anti-apartheid movement, as well as published with the black radical um, press. Um, she was, um, it was stated that she was in um, the circles of like Coretta Scott King and different civil rights activists. So I do believe when it comes to understanding more of her, um, I guess being overtly um, open when she um, discussed certain things, um, there needs to be more information about what was going on with Phyllis Dundala when she was in the United States. For example, she spent 10 years in Detroit, Michigan teaching at Wayne State University. However, in the book, she only um, talks about it briefly. So um, I, I do feel that there are still more information um, to be known about Phyllis Dundala. And I think uh, some of that information can be um, found in the diaspora. So um, I just wanted to add that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tiffany. I think you've added so much, um, so much color I guess, um, to her persona outside of South African history and the engagement with Bantu education. Um, I'd also like to forward again to the speakers a question by Baba Alwa, who seems to have left us already, I think. And her question relates to her interest. Um, I think Tiffany has already mentioned in part some of her, of her work in the United States, but also her critique of post-1994 um, would any of the speakers uh, want to uh, perhaps contribute in any way to that or speak to that, her critiques of the negotiated settlement and House of Society post-1994? Prof? Um, I'm not familiar. Um, um, if, uh, I can just say that I'm not familiar um, with um, her work post-1994. Um, I just um, know of a critique, for instance, of her health system when she came, uh, sorry, of our health systems when she came back uh, for that brief period. Um, and no, 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 I think I'm confusing Nonich Abavu and, um, sorry, pardon me, no, it's, it's two different people. I'm, I'm not familiar. So let me hand over to you, Professor Sasanti. Apologies. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it would be recalled that, uh, you know, uh, Ma'am Tantala had clearly aligned herself against capitalism and had clearly aligned herself with socialism. So um, when the arrangement took place um, in South Africa, we would know um, that many, um, for instance, um, our father, uh, Nelson Mandela, came out saying that, uh, you know, in pursuit and in line with the Freedom Charter, that uh, there would be nationalization. Uh, but it didn't take long for him to say that, um, that uh, he turned around and said that uh, he realized that it would be suicidal. Uh, and so we've had other explanations that were given by his successor, Tabombeki, when they went to Cuba um, and they were told by Fidel Castro not to nationalize because it would be so exciting since there was no person power to do that kind of work. But the radical that she was then, you know, she, she was unhappy um, with all of that and uh, made her views uh, clear uh, because, um, you know, she was one of those who held the view that um, you could not, uh, you know, apartheid uh, could neither be reformed nor be accommodated, and all its other um, links, such as capitalism, but it had to be destroyed. So you would then appreciate that uh, she was for a revolution, not an evolution, or rather, she was for a revolution, not reforms. Um, and though what we've had in this country, um, thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much. Um, any last uh, questions or comments before I allow our speakers to uh, close off with any final comments they might have? Any comments? Or... Okay. If not, I would like to read um, an excerpt actually from her uh, autobiography in which uh, life is a mosaic. A flock without lambs is doomed. A herd without calves has no future. A people whose children are doomed, doomed to ignorance has no future. It is our children who are, by this act, that is the Abundant Education Act, condemned to a world of darkness and ignorance, who will never fit in anywhere in the world after being shut away from the rest of humanity by Abundant Education. If we all realize that, we cannot, no matter what the odds, stand idly by and let that happen. Where are the mothers in this hall who will say, never, not to my child? Where are the women of this nation who will say, never, not our children? Have we less courage than the mother hen that will dare the falcon that swoops down on her young? I think uh, it may have a historic relevance, but I also think it's quite the clarion call for the future as well. Um, thank you very much to the speakers. Uh, you've given this uh, event an incredible, uh, an incredible amount of productivity and intellectual depth, for which I think everyone in attendance um, can agree. Um, I will now hand over to uh, Osis Ayanda uh, in order for her to provide us with her word of thanks. Is that okay? Osis Ayanda? Hi, Seto. Hi. And, and, and perhaps maybe you can just allow even, if it's two minutes for Prof. Maseko and Prof. Sasande to provide their very brief closing remarks, and then we'll, we'll then Certainly. hand over to, to Ayanda. Thank you. Certainly, I think that would be great. Profs, uh, please. Thank you. Be uh, greatly Prof. honored. I'd like, I had the first word, and I'd like Professor Maseko to have the last word. Um, after all, uh, this is a women's issue more than it is a men's issue. And I'd like to begin by thanking everyone um, that came, and again, Kandrat for hosting us. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Maseko for a brilliant uh, response and the insights that she gave. I truly appreciate this. And I'm hoping that, as I said uh, in the beginning of my openings, uh, next year will mark 30 years of the existence of the less appreciated book by Phyllis Ntantala. I'm hoping that, um, you know, the, and I saw that Ubabalwa uh, Makokwana, Dr. Ubabalwa Makokwana just left. I'm hoping that together with them, we may be able next year in the memory of Felis Ntandala to campaign for the recognition of a book so that it can be given um, the, the space that it deserves um, on the 30th, 30th anniversary of the existence of this book. Thank you very much. Thank you again.
right. okay. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, let me also thank everybody uh, for their um, contributions. Um, I just want to, for me, the last word really is to plead with, with us in the academy that um, I think talking about um, women voices um, or marginalized women voices is not enough. Um, we need to understand that we need to unearth um, those voices and it's not an easy task. Um, I'm just reminded as I'm speaking now of um, poetry of um, uh, S.E.K. Mkai, one of the leading poets um, in the country, um, where she writes biographical poems um, on women, especially um, at time of, um, of, their, of their death, and how he, he captures them as um, teachers um, of society, and the way he captures how um, women having been um, taken away from their families to live um, as peasants um, in um, white uh, families, how they learned to read and write, and in turn taught their husbands um, how to read and write and 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 um, uh, yes and read the Bible um, and write. And so obviously those um, narratives are not going to be captured um, in the library halls um, as we know them, but we need to go to the archive um, and we need to understand that the archive is not going to come packaged in the way that we used um, to an archive. In terms of language, in terms of form, um, it will be newspapers um, because this is where most of these people wrote um, when um, their writings were censored. Um, it will be um, in poetic form. It will be not in the normal narrative that we know um, academic writings um, to be in. It will be in proverbs. Uh, it will be in idioms. And so our role in the academy is to really go deep in understanding um, that kind of scholarship. So thank you very much for the opportunity to really give my thoughts on Umamu um, Phyllis Landal. Um, Thank you very much, Prof. Um, it is I who it is us who are extremely grateful um, for both your time and your insights, as well as to everyone else who contributed to the discussion. I will now hand over to Usus Ayanda for um, the vote of thanks. Um, Usus Ayanda, I'm here. Thank you so much. Um, um, good evening, everyone. Sure, what a great way um, for us to close this month that is dedicated to women. We've sadly come to an end of this amazing lecture, and my job tonight is very easy, short, and sweet. Um, Shane can write, um, especially Mr. Sponwabo, your man and his entire team. Um, also, to thank you, our esteemed speakers, Prof. Simpio Santi from UWC, Prof. Um, Pamela Maseko, the Executive Dean of Humanities um, at NMU, and our um, facilitator, Setu Nguna from UKZN for um, such a certainly lot list, um, our lovely audience here on Zoom, um, on the YouTube channel and other social platforms. We thank you everyone for taking the time to join us tonight. We look forward to engaging with you in the near future. Thank you everyone and a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Ayanda. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Ellen. Good, good to see you, Ellen. Yes. Okay, Pamela. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. I'll see you tomorrow at five. Good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Comrade okay. Dalan. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to remain with, with Sesanti. Can, can uh, Sonwabo, uh, Sonwabo, yeah. would you allow us with, with Alan and Sesanti?
Um, I, I have to go now. Sorry, man. I have got to go to another meeting. Um, we'll we'll chat. We'll chat tomorrow. Okay. Let, yeah. let, okay. let, let, let me speak. I'm here, Prof. Mat